Good morning. Let's have a round of applause for our choir as they filter back in here. Appreciate them. Well, my five-year-old had swim lessons this week, and he had them last year, but we weren't real sure what he remembered. You know, he's a, a beach baby, and so he's not used to the pool. He's used to going to the beach. In fact, first time he ever went to the pool, he was staying near the steps, and he would get out in the middle of the pool with me, and then he would say he wanted to go back to shore. So, you know, that's how you know you've been at the beach before we went to the pool. But anyway, uh, we, we wanted to see where he was with the swimming and going underwater and all that kind of thing. And, and the entire week, he was worried that his swim teacher was going to dunk him underwater. And I said, you don't need anything to worry about. She's not a Baptist. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, but no, we, we, uh, I, I told him, she's not going to dunk you, you know, unsuspecting. Don't worry about that. And when we talked to her and we said, we've talked to her and she's not going to do that. But he was worried all week on the last day that that would happen. So last day happened and, uh, you know, he put his face in the water and went underwater and had a great time and, and she never dunked him. He never drowned. He never sank. He kept telling us he would sink to the bottom he never sank to the bottom. And then after that, amazingly, since those lessons have ended, he wants to take a bath every night. It was, it's always a, a, a big deal to get him a bath. Now he wants to put his goggles on and take a bath. So now bath time is fun. In fact, last night, you know, he, he, uh, we had bathed him the night before, and then he went to the pool all day yesterday. And Emily said, I couldn't get him out of the pool now. And then last night he wanted a bath, and I said, no, we're, we're just going to bed. You don't need a bath today. And he cried that he couldn't get a bath. So that fear and that worry that he had about swim has now turned into where he wants to do it all the time. Fear, worry, anxiety is a common struggle that we all face from time to time. Now, these emotions, they can be caused by all sorts of factors, financial stress, health concerns, just general uncertainty about the future. Maybe a traumatic experience happened and you don't want that to happen again. There's other fears that we have that we probably really shouldn't have because the chances of anything life-threatening happening is very low, such as the fear of flying. You've all heard the statistics about the fear of flying. Hardly anyone ever dies from a plane crash. But you're thinking, but I might be the one, all right? Fear of heights, and then uh, the second biggest fear, other than just the fear of death, is the fear of public speaking, which is a real fear. Uh, but you very seldom die from any of those activities. But we fear those situations Nonetheless, as Christians, we are commanded to trust in God's providence and overcome our anxieties with faith in Him. The passage we're looking at today centers around a doctrine that is known as the providence of God. This is the concept that God is sovereign over all, He rules over all, and He reigns over all. In some way, you can say that God is in complete control of your life. But not only your life, He's in complete control over all aspects of the universe, all of human existence and history. God reigns supreme over all the events of our lives. Yes, our actions, our choices matter. We make real decisions with real consequences. But God's providence ultimately reigns over everything. We're going to see today in this passage how God's providence helps us with fear, worry, and anxiety. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, 
Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Heavenly Father, what an amazing promise you've given us that our anxiety is not for tomorrow. It may not even be for today. That tomorrow comes, tomorrow takes care of itself. You reign over all that and all these things. So Lord, every one of us in here will struggle with this from time to time. Some version of fear, some version of worry, some version of anxiety. Show us today how we can trust you through those temptations. Father, I pray that my words today will reflect your heart and its meaning, that you will fill me with your spirit through preaching. And Lord, I pray that those in here today and those watching from home or elsewhere will receive this message and it will change their lives. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to preface before we get into this that the most common Mental illness is how it's defined in the United States, which affects 18.1% of the population, is anxiety disorders. Now, they develop from a complex set of risk factors, including genetics and brain chemistry and personality and life events and all these things, and, and how even to deal with these things can be a controversial subject in Christian circles, and so that's not what I'm getting into today. Because I don't really think this passage has that necessarily in mind. I believe what Jesus is talking about is general, everyday worry, fear, and anxiety, which every person on the planet has. So this is a message that is all uh, that is relevant to all of us, because we all deal with anxiety, we all deal with fear, we all deal with worry, and some of it is more debilitating than others. So this is relevant to all of us. So I want to give you three truths today to hold on to, to help you with your fear and worry and anxiety. Number one, know that God has authority over your circumstances. Know that God has authority over your circumstances. Verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. So Jesus begins by addressing the tendency of people to worry about the basic necessities of life, food, drink, clothing. And he reminds us that life is more than these things and that worrying about them only adds to our troubles and does nothing to solve the problem. When he says, therefore, he's referring to the previous section, where he's told us that he is our master, that we are his slaves, we are his servants. And so he says, because I'm your master, therefore, don't worry about your life because I'm over your life. I am your authority. So you don't need to worry about where your meal will come from. A slave doesn't have to worry about being fed because the master wants them fed so the slave can do work. 
That's what he's saying. He's master over our lives. Don't worry about this. I have authority over you. He says, don't be anxious about your life. When he uses the word life, this is referring to our entire constitution, our entire being, our physical self, our our mental self, our emotional, our spiritual self. He says, don't worry about your life. Don't be anxious about it. Yet, general worry, we'll just call it general worry, is a sin that Christians do more frequently than others. And some don't even know it's a sin, or they don't act like it is. The word translated anxious has the meaning of strangling, choking. And that's what worry just does. It it strangles the joy out of life. It chokes the joy out of life. It chokes out all your other emotions so that you can only dwell on what worries you. He says, do not be anxious about what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Food, water, clothing, these are the three basic necessities of life. Many of us don't have to worry about these necessities. All of you today, praise the Lord, are wearing clothes. You probably don't have a problem with food or drink. Don't worry about these basic necessities. Many of the problems that you have are not first-tier problems. You have water, yes. You have food, yes. You have clothes. Now, every now and then, we might know someone who doesn't. And that, but even still, Jesus tells them, even if you're worried about where your next meal will come from, even if you're worried about what you're going to wear, he says, don't. He says he will provide. And he adds, is not life more than food? Some may say no, but we know it is. And the body more than clothing? There's more to life about worrying about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. Then he says in verse 26, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. The birds have food given to them. You know, animals will find food. Uh, Over a year ago, or about a year ago, when a cat, a kitten, uh, came up on our porch, we bought it cat food, put food out there, and every now and then, I'll go outside to check on the food. And what I've realized is I'm not just feeding my kitty. I'm feeding raccoons. I'm feeding um, possums. I was trying to think of what it was called, possums. I'm feeding something else I saw, another critter. I can't remember what it was, raccoon, possum. No, it may have been. I don't know what it was, but uh, something. And then the other day I walked out. And I was changing the headlight in Emily's van, and I was walking off to the van to make sure that it was working, and this bush was beside me. I heard this, you know, in the bush. I figured it was a squirrel. I looked in there, and there were two baby raccoons just doing this, (laughs) wanting to play. And I said, what in the world? I live in town, right? So I think because I have the food out there, some different critters have been coming and then yesterday I pulled in the driveway and there was this black cat. Where did you come from? I don't know. So we're having to bring the food in every now and then. The point is, he says, look at the birds there. God provides for them. Animals will find their food. Amen. <laughs> in this context of ancient Israel, the people were accustomed to relying on themselves and their own efforts for survival. But Jesus says that he's the ultimate provider. Birds do not sow. They don't reap. They can't plant a garden. They can't reap their harvest. God feeds them, though. God provides for them. He gives them the words, the worms in the grounds to feed on. Birds depend on God's nature. All animals do this. And he says, if God takes care of the birds of the air, how much will he provide for his children? 
And he asks us a question that's supposed to make us feel silly about ourselves. He says, are you not of more value than they? Because we're made in the image of God, we have a certain inherent intrinsic value that other parts of creation do not have. As much as my wife loves that kitty, she and my children are worth more than that kitty. Amen. You've just not evolved from some primordial slime. You're just not uh, the, the product of two atoms banging together. You're not just some accident. You are made in the image of the almighty and powerful God of heaven. You have value, and you have it because you are made in God's image. You are not an accident. You've been planned before, since before you were born. Because of this, you have much more value than the animals, he says. You are the crown of God's creation. And because of this, Jesus has promised to take care of of your needs. Now, we like to have a plan written out. Okay, Jesus, tell me how you're going to do it. Well, he doesn't give us the plan. He just says, I'm going to do it because of who you are and who I want you to be. God is in control of our circumstances. It says in verse 27, which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? The answer is, You can't. Charles Spurgeon, 19th century pastor, said, Anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. Generation Z, in its successor, Generation Alpha, I have two children in Z and I have two children in Alpha, so they're the younger ones, right? It's been called the, the anxious generation. In the last decade, there's been a dramatic decline in teen mental health. There's an author named Jonathan Haidt. He's an atheist, so don't go out and believe everything he says. But he wrote a book about this, and he argues uh, that there's something called the great rewiring of childhood. And he says this occurred between the years of 2010 and 2015 when the cell phone and the iPad and things became more prevalent. He says, during this time, childhood transitioned from being primarily play-based to being primarily phone-based. And we, we see this. We don't disagree with this. He says, by the early 2010s, our phones transformed from Swiss Army knives, which we pulled out when we needed a tool, to platforms upon which companies competed to see who could hold on to eyeballs the longest. He says this has increased the anxiety of a generation. And this atheist, his his solution is that looking at religion and the transcendental and the supernatural is our only hope. I mean, when an atheist realizes it, you know that's the truth. See, worrying is a lack of of trust in God. And this lack of trust can have severe negative effects on our mental health, our physical health. And so we must ask God to help us replace worry with faith in Him. Should we plan for our future? Yes. Should we plan for our life? Yes. But we must realize that we are not totally in control of our lives that God is, that He is authority over all circumstances. You're here today because God allows you to be here today, in this room today. We don't provide for ourselves. God provides for us. We don't own our things. God actually owns them and gives them to us. We plan for our future, but we're not to be anxious about the circumstances of our lives. Trust and know that God has all the authority of your circumstances. Secondly, know that God has authority over your security. Authority over your security. Verse 28. And why are you anxious about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Reference to the wildflowers, the grasses that, that grow virtually everywhere. Our grass outside has been a little crunchy lately. Thankfully, we got some rain. But he says, a beautiful patch of lilies do not design themselves. They, they, they don't decide to bloom certain colors. They bloom because God has designed them to bloom. And he says in verse 29, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon, the richest king on the face of the earth, he could not clothe himself with more beauty than a God-made flower. You know, we have a big uh, tree outside um, in the front yard, and I just forgot the name of the tree, um, magnolia tree. And uh, go out there, and when it blooms, especially after it's rained, and the water is on the petals, and you can see one of those blooms, it's the prettiest thing in the world. And that's what he's saying, that even Solomon is not clothed like the pretty flowers. He says in verse 30, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? He says even the flowers and the grass, really quickly, one day will cease to exist. And he makes them beautiful, only to be discarded. He says, if God will take care of a flower that is so tremendously beautiful, but eventually is destroyed, like not even thinking about it, he'll take care of you. Clothes give us a sense of security. The primary purpose is to cover up the shame of our sin that was realized in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, they instantly felt their nakedness, and exposed them. So they sought clothes to cover their shame. That's part of what we do when we wear clothes, to cover up our bodies. And as you get older, and your body doesn't look the way you want to it. You, wear, you really wear clothes to cover up, as I've learned. God will clothe you. You don't have to worry about your security. He has authority over that. Number three, know that God has authority over your future. That's really what we're worried about most of the time is the future on some level. Verse 31, therefore, he repeats himself, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Anxiety can stem from having misplaced priorities and not seeking God's kingdom first. He says, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We worry when we seek the future things of the world first, but seek God's kingdom, which the Lord's Prayer, which we talked about two weeks ago, talks about praying for God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Seek God's kingdom means that everything is subservient to His will. And that is central to our existence to fill up our lives with this desire to do his eternal work. Verse 34, so therefore, again, a third time, he says, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious about for itself, sufficient for the day is his own trouble. Martin Luther said, pray and let God worry. <laughs> It's been said that God is the God of tomorrow just as He is the God of today. When some worries, when some warriors have nothing to worry about, they may create hypothetical, fictional situations of which to worry. Well, what if this happens? Well, what if that happens? Worry can become an addiction. 
slowly drains, slowly kills the joy out of life. And as worry and anxiety build, faith in God's character slowly decreases. As worry goes up, faith in God goes down. God's saying he gives us the grace that we need to live day by day. So in closing today, I want to give us some steps of how we can trust God to stop worrying. You want to hear those today? I think we need to hear these. Let's, let's give a few steps about how to trust God to stop worrying. Number one, take your worries and anxieties to God in prayer in Scripture. Take your worries and anxieties to God in prayer in Scripture. The first line of offense is taking it to the Lord. Look at Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So take your worries to Him. I think we don't take them to Him because we're not really, maybe we don't really believe He's going to do anything about it. I think we know he's able, but is he really willing? Take him to God. Secondly, surrender control of your life. Surrender control. Remind yourself that God is ultimately in control of all things. You didn't decide to be born. God didn't consult with you in heaven and said, all right, now I'm going to send you down there in your mother's womb. Here's your mother. Are you okay with this? We had no decision-making authority in that. He had it all. Surrender control of your life. Know that he's in control. Third, focus on all the ways God has provided for you in the past. You know, a lot of worries we have. Do we think about, you know, that has never happened yet. Okay. You know, little John David, you've never sank to the ground. You've never drowned in your five years of life. So why do you think it's going to happen now? We've never let that happen. You're not going, that's not going to happen. God has a track record for how he has provided for you in the future. You know what that track record is? You're still alive. You're here today. Nothing has killed you yet. You might have had some pain. You might have had some discomfort, but you're here today. God hasn't let you down yet. You're here. Focus on the track record for God has provided for you. Fourth, surround yourself with a community of believers. This is why when you're saved, you are saved into a community of believers. God knows that we need a community of faith to help us. Did a funeral Friday for Mr. Harvey Mullis. Many of you know Mr. Harvey. And he was 88, 89. The sad thing about funerals is the older you get, the less people come to them. Unfortunately, that does happen. But we ran out of bulletins. This place was full. Why? Because he had a community of faith, a community of believers that have lived that faith life with him for so many years. And it can encourage with you, pray for you during times of anxiety and worry. I've done funerals for people who didn't go to church. I've done funerals for people who didn't have a church home that they needed a pastor to do them. And I've done funerals where four people showed up. They had no community of believers, no church family. Surround yourself with that. Let them pray for you. Let them love you. Let them help you with your life. And number five, trust in God's character. Trust in God's character. Remind yourself of God's faithfulness in your life. Remind yourself of his love that he's given you, his, his promises, and trust 
that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you, even in the midst of your anxieties. You're going to say, yeah, but what about, what about those missionaries who went off overseas and were killed when they are in their 20s? Or, and it happens, people die. Yes, they do. But God says, don't be anxious about it. He says, I will take care of you in my way until I call you home, when that day would be. I gave you life, and I'll call you home when it's my time to do so. Trust in God's character that he never leaves us, never forsakes us, even in the midst of our anxieties. He's not going to dunk us. He's not a Baptist. <laughs> well, maybe he is. He's not going to let us drown. He's going to be there with us, even in our fears. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being there with us. Thank you so much for giving us these promises where three times in this one passage you tell us, do not be anxious. Lord, we confess to you today how we are anxious, how we, do, how we are fearful, how we do worry, and Lord, that lack of faith in you is sin. So Lord, I, I pray that we will repent of that sin today. And Lord, we thank you that you forgive us. And that you help us and enable us to continue to live the life that you've given us, that you want us to live. To enjoy life, to enjoy being a child of God, to, to reach others with the gospel to be able to make disciples. That's what you've called us to do. So, Father, let us have courage in fear because we know who you are. And we can trust in you when that fearful day comes. Father, there's one here today that's never placed their faith in you that today would be the day of their salvation. That today they would turn from their sins and place their faith in you. You would save them. Give them eternal life. For those of us, Lord, that have been following you for years, that have been disciples of you, give us that courage we need, Lord, to, in the day of trouble, to place our faith in you. Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen.